Well, good morning, beloved brethren. And to those who may be listening and watching online, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a blessed day. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there as well. It's lovely to have so many in our congregation here this morning. It's a privilege to stand behind this pulpit and to bring to you the Word of God this morning. If you have God's Word with you, God's precious, preserved and perfect Word, please join with me in turning to Galatians chapter 1. The book of Galatians... Galatians chapter 1, and we've been in a series which I've entitled The Kingdom of the Cults. We've been examining various false belief systems which have been out there, propagated by the evil one, and we've been countering uh, them with the inerrant uh, Word of God. If you recall in our previous time together, we touched on the hideous theology known as Calvinism and their five-point theology known as Tulip. So today we're going to examine a false belief system uh, which is drawn from that theology. It's popular amongst evangelical Christianity. And it's called Lordship Salvation. So this morning we're going to examine what Lordship Salvation is, who is promoting it, why are people being led to it, and how it differs from the biblical uh, doctrine of salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. So we're going to read Galatians chapter 1, church, verses 6 down to verse 10, and then we'll have a word of prayer. So Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul speaking, he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there will be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your inerrant, sure word here this morning. We thank you, Lord, that salvation is by grace through faith in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for your people here this morning. I thank you you've brought them here to hear your word being preached. I'm humbled to stand behind this pulpit. Though weak, though vile, though sinful, you've raised me up by your grace and for your purpose of preaching the gospel. And so I do pray, Lord, that you would use me, uh, Lord, to minister to your saints. In the name of Jesus Christ may be honoured, glorified and magnified by my preaching. We do proclaim how much we love you, Lord. You are worthy of our praises, and to you we give them, and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> well, dear church, it's not a more important doctrine in the sacred scriptures than that of salvation. For one's very soul's eternity hangs on the most weighty of, weightiest of all questions. What must I do to be saved? Heaven and hell is at stake. One's eternal dwelling place is on the line, and therefore it is most crucial for us as the saints of Jesus to understand this doctrine and to be able to uh, communicate and articulate this doctrine to believe it to other unsaved people that they may become believers like us in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, from the vilest of sinner to the most self-righteous religious man, we are all in need of the glorious gospel of Jesus. All are in need of rescuing from the perils of hell. For all of Adam's race, dying and sinful race, Jesus proclaimed, must be born again. Now, before we read text, we have the Apostle Paul outlining the serious and solemn nature of this important topic. For there were many within the churches of Galatia advocating for a salvation of faith plus works, faith plus obedience to the law of Moses in order to inherit eternal life. For, for instead of preaching the gospel, they were perverting the gospel, changing it and in doing so to the destruction of their own soul. So we have this beloved epistle of Galatians. It was the earliest of Paul's letters. Scholars dating it to around 48 AD. So we can see right from the installment of the church age, men and women have had to fight for the doctrine of grace, fight for the gospel of the grace of God. And I'll endeavour to do that here this morning. This is because the Adamic man, those who are in their unregenerate state, almost always want to insist that salvation or gaining eternal life, going into heaven, must be accompanied by some sort of works. If you were to go out and to witness to certain people, 
What would their response be? We have to do good works. You have to do something to inherit eternal life. But the Bible says something else. See, the church, this is because sinful men have always had a hard time accepting that the salvation of a soul is a free gift. It's totally of grace. For many believe, and it's a mixture of faith and works, which is, as we've seen, is the old Galatian era. As we've seen throughout this series on the cults, what do they have all in common? Well, of course, they preach a different Jesus, among other things, but what they really do is they add works. Jehovah's Witnesses, works. Mormons, works. Roman Catholicism, works. Seven-day Adventism, works. And so on and so forth. And they focus on works. They focus on what you can do for God instead of what God has done for you in the person and work of Jesus Christ. See, church, this stands in stark contrast to biblical Christianity. For For the religion of man says, do. But the religion of Jesus Christ says, done. Lord Jesus Christ, but upon the cross of Calvary, his dying breath, he said, it is finished. He got the ghost and he died in our place. He died for our sins. He rose again the third day for our justification. And he offers eternal life as a free gift to whoever believes in him. As you can see on the screen there, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you would, church, turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 15, church. Acts Chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. So what is this modern perversion of the gospel known as Lordship Salvation, which is being spread today? And who is promoting it? Well, it's extremely common within uh, reform circles, those who hold to the tradition of Calvinism. And we see here in the sin, the saviour and salvation, uh, Robert Leitner, describes it as Lordship salvation refers to the belief that the sinner who wants to be saved must not only trust Christ as his substitute, but he must also surrender every area of his life to the complete control of Christ. So we can see from this definition, this proponents of this sort of soteriology, it says that for unregenerate sinner to be saved, they must not only trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, but also be willing to surrender every area of their life in order to go to heaven. And often you can tell uh, many advocates of Lordship Salvation by the way in which they present the gospel message. They use words such as willing, be willing to surrender all to Jesus, repent of all your sins, obey Christ's commands, forsake and turn from all your sins, take up your cross and follow him. And a phrase they often use is, if he is not Lord of all, then he is not Lord of at all. But friends, he's already the Lord. He's already the Lord. Amen. We don't need to make him the Lord. He is already the Lord of glory. Now, I don't know about many of you, but when I came to the Lord in 2012, I didn't give up those sins immediately. I just believed upon Jesus Christ. I knew his offer of eternal life, that whoever believes in him would be saved. I had a lot of baggage when I came to the Lord. And so the Lord worked on my heart eventually through discipleship, through reading of his word. But those things are discipleship, they're not salvation. So where did this come from? Where did this lordship salvation come from? Well, pastors, they looked out upon their flock and they saw many within their congregation professing Christ, but yet had no or little fruit to back up their profession. So instead of discipling them, instead of preaching the sound biblical doctrine to help them grow and mature in the faith, to grow in the grace of God, They instead changed the message of the gospel itself to a message which would include discipleship as a part of salvation. But unfortunately, those who changed the gospel message, they had the right diagnosis of the church, the state of the church, but that that there may be superficial conversions, that there may be shallow and unfruitful believers, but my friend, it's the wrong cure. For adding works to the gospel... Or requirements for discipleship to the gospel is putting a burden upon the sinner in which they are unable to do. This is exactly what we see in Acts chapter 15, where the Judaizers are from Jerusalem. They came down to Antioch to teach this false discipleship message. And so look down at verse 1. The Bible says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, 
Except you be circumcised after the, the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul or Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem about, uh, unto the apostles and elders about this question. Jump down to verse 5, church, and it continues. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know that how a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And he put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? He says, this, this is the conclusion of the matter. He says, but we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. You see, friends, in this passage, we have these legalistic Pharisees putting this yoke upon the neck of the believers of the adherence to the law of Moses, insisting that they must be circumcised uh, to be saved. It's the same today with those who promote lordship salvation, adding to the message of the gospel of faith alone in Jesus Christ, a necessary requirement of obedience to Christ, of forsaking of sins, which is legalism and works salvation. For instead of faithfully preaching the counsel of God and the clear gospel of the grace of God to build up the believers in Jesus Christ, they add to it a legalistic message which has no power to transform a child of Adam. So what is the cure for the unfruitful Christians? What is the power of God unto salvation? Well, friends, can I say it's not you reforming your life. It's not you even turning from your sins or your willingness to legalistically obey Jesus Christ. But it's the belief in a crucified, buried and risen Saviour. The Bible says in Romans 1.18, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 18 says, For the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are not saved, but to us who are saved, it is the power of God. Friends, the, the power of God unto salvation is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you believe in the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ this morning, raise a hand. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, I can remember clearly that I had the word of the truth of the gospel preached to me some uh, 11 years ago. I knew its power. I knew its truth. It's what I was looking for. And I believed its promise that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. See, dear friends, we mustn't change the message of the gospel just because there may be some Christians who profess Christ and yet are still not bearing fruit in their life. There may be some false conversions, but that's not up, up to us. That's up to God. Amen. We must rather continue to preach clearly, preach boldly, and preach powerfully that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. So church, who's promoting this teaching? Well, I'm sure most of you would probably recognise this picture, a famous advocate of Lordship Salvation. He is John MacArthur. He's the pastor of Grace Community Church in California in the United States. And his ministry and impact and reach on the church is indeed great. Many of millions of book sales, study Bibles, television and radio programs going around all around the world. And can I say, he has much great material in his teachings. Many great things he says and, and teaches and preaches. Um, but he does err in one matter, that he teaches this lordship salvation. And can I say, friend, you can be very articulate in preaching, in very informative and in denouncing even false doctrines. Very popular amongst the church even. But if you cannot articulate the gospel message, if you cannot preach the gospel of Jesus Christ without perverting it, then you have no right to stand behind a pulpit in the church of God. 
See, the words of the Bible puts forth incredibly, incredibly strong language regarding those who mix faith and works. The Bible says one is accursed. One has fallen from grace. And so we may, ne- may we never fall away from teaching grace, exalting grace. For without the grace of God, none of us would be able to stand. Amen. So let's examine this quote from John MacArthur to see if he's preaching the gospel of the grace of God or if he's preaching something else. And he says this, this is from his uh, book, The Gospel According to Jesus, page 140. You can look it up for yourself. It says, eternal life is a free gift. And we would say amen to that. Amen. Salvation cannot be earned with good deeds or purchased with money. It has already been bought by Christ who paid the ransom with his blood. Now, if he stopped there, we would all say amen, amen. That's a good gospel message, amen. But he continues, but that does not mean there is no cost in terms of salvation's impact on the sinner's life. This paradox may be difficult, but it is nevertheless true. Salvation, he says, is both free and costly. And he goes on to say, thus, in a sense, we pay the ultimate price for our salvation when our sinful self is nailed to the cross. He goes on to say, it denotes implicit obedience, full surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Nothing else can qualify as saving faith. Dear beloved of Christ, this is exactly what you would call double speak. Saying one thing and yet in the same breath, contradicting himself in the same sentence. It's free and yet it's costly. There's an inconsistency and confusion. No wonder so many people are confused about how to go to heaven today. He says it's, it's free and yet it's costly. It costs you something, but friends, it costs the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Our salvation, amen. All righty, so it can't be both, can it? Works and faith. And we have this great verse. I love this verse. It's Romans chapter 11 and verse 6. And it, it contrasts grace and it contrasts works. And the Apostle Paul says this, If it be by grace, then there's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, there's no more of grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So we see that it's either by grace through faith or it's by your works. You either work your way or you accept God's terms of salvation, which is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We have another quote here from John MacArthur. This is a transcript from one of his sermons. I don't mean to pick on John MacArthur alone, but this is just what I was uh, I saw in my research. And so he said this, At the point of your salvation, you made a promise to submit to the Lord. You made a pledge at that time to be obedient to Christ. You confessed him as Lord. And Lord means that he is above all. It's essentially that uh, then as believers we are to remember that we made a covenant of obedience when we confessed Jesus as Lord. He goes on to say down the bottom, and you need to go back and remember that you and have the integrity to be faithful to your original promise. So we see that John MacArthur is quite confused on the message of salvation. It's, he believes it's not simply by receiving Jesus Christ as one saviour, but rather it's a covenant, it's a bilateral covenant which you make with God. How we promise to obey God, how we made a pledge to submit to him, how we promise to do good works for him. But friends, that is not the gospel. Is the gospel you making a commitment to someone? What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news, church. The good news. In, Roman, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, it outlines the gospel which Paul preached. And he said that how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, how he was buried, and the third day he rose again from the dead for our justification. That is the gospel message. And you see on the screen there, we all sinners. We all deserve death. We all deserve God's judgment. All have sinned, the Bible says, and come short of the glory of God. And no matter what we do to bridge that gap, no matter what we do, good works, you turning over a new leaf in your life, you doing good works, that will not accomplish your salvation. The Bible says we hear the word of the gospel and then we believe and then we are given the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that once we believe the gospel, we go from death to life. We have eternal life. Amen. This is the message of the gospel. See there in Romans chapter 4 and verse 5, it's very clear. But to him that works, not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. This is because, friends, salvation is a gift. 
It's unearned, it's unmerited, and it's undeserved. But we praise God for that unspeakable gift of salvation. Amen. Amen. Dear friend, this is because there is but one condition to enter into the pearly gates of heaven. It's not the submission to Christ's lordship. It's not you forsaking or repenting of your sins. It's not you turning from your sinful lifestyle. It's not even you repeating a prayer. Rather, it is believing on Jesus Christ. The great theologian and founder of Dallas Theological, Theological College, Dr. Lewis Schaefer, stated that up to 150 passages in Scripture, the condition of salvation is upon believing only. We have some famous verses there on the screen uh, for, for you if you want to jot them down. Acts 16, he brought them out and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Repent of your sins? No. Get baptised? No. Turn from your sins? No, he says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. So I ask one and all this morning, have you trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross or are you trusting your obedience to Jesus? There is a difference, church. There is a difference. And I want you to understand that today. Because many people think that they're righteous because they've, they've, they've quit their smoking, they've quit their drinking, they've quit their sinful lifestyle because they serve in a homeless shelter or so on and so forth. But none of that will make you righteous in the sight of God, but only trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen. You may well say, well, preacher, you're just arguing over words. You're just debating semantic wordplay. Well, my friends, words matter. How you present the gospel to someone matters. Because Satan in this age of grace, he wants being preached. He suddenly uses this lordship salvation to get mankind to trust in themselves. He doesn't want you to trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He wants you to trust yourself, thinking you're a good person. You're, you, by your works, you can go to heaven. And that's his message he preaches today. So if you would, church, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I think Brother Paul uh, touched on this last week. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to see the subtlety of Satan. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to read verses 3 and 4. The Bible says, says this, But I fear... Lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the what? The simplicity that is in Christ. For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might bear well with him. Jump down to verse 13. He continues, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, don't wonder about these things, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Dear friends, we see in our text here the subtle craftiness of Satan. For this adversary of our soul was not one to come out altogether and deny the doctrine of faith alone in Jesus Christ. But what he does is he raises up certain individuals to herald a confused gospel, a complicated gospel, a counterfeit gospel. And what is its result? Well, instead of it being a clear and simple and powerful gospel message, it's confused, it's messy. So the hearer cannot comprehend what he or she has to do to be saved. Now, no, no doubt God can use a sloppy presentation of the gospel to get a sinner to trust in Jesus Christ. But we must use the words and terminology in which the Holy Bible uses. Because this, friends, is the Holy Word of God. The words of life, the words of truth, the words which herald salvation. Amen. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is the message of the gospel. See, friends, did not the ancient serpent in the garden suddenly change God's command when speaking to Eve? Yea, hath God said? Thus is the same today through his ministers, whom outwardly masquerade as ministers of the gospel, but inwardly they doing the, uh, the will of the evil one. 
by twisting God's simple plan of salvation into a confused, self-righteous, works-based gospel. As they question the word of God, they say, did God really say that salvation's by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ? Did God really uh, pay for all your sins on the cross? Don't you have to do something to inherit eternal life? Don't you have to work for it? Don't you have to be obedient to him? Don't you have to make a pledge to God that you'll serve him and so on and so forth? Is it really that simple? Friends, it is that simple. And thus we should never be moved away from the hope of the simplicity of the gospel, of a crucified, buried, and risen, ascended Lord Jesus Christ, but rather continue to herald it far and wide as the only message of salvation. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but by faith in me. But friends, not only does this, this lordship theology is confusing through its counterfeit message, It also is confusing because it places an impossible burden upon the lost, an impossible burden upon the unsaved. You would church turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. The book of Galatians chapter 3. As we briefly discussed already that often in a presentation from these sorts of preachers will include phrases such as be willing to commit your life to Jesus, surrender your life to Jesus, make him Lord of your life. Be willing to forsake all of your sins. Submit to the Lordship of Christ. Now, friends, these are very, very, very good things to do as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. We should be repenting of our sins daily. We should be forsaking our sins daily. We should submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He's worthy because he's Lord. But we must not confuse them to say that's how we are to be saved. You see, condemned sinner cannot do these things because he has not the spirit. He's still in his unregenerate state For it is impossible, I repeat, it is impossible for a condemned sinner to obey such commands, to turn from sin, to commit your life to the Lordship of Christ, because that person is dead. He's dead to God, dead to righteousness, dead to the things of God. He cannot please God by his works. He cannot do anything of spiritual value because he is not just sick, he is dead and he has not the spirit. So he must be cleansed by the Saviour, amen? He must be given a new nature. He must be given the spirit of the resurrected Christ. But you may ask, how does one receive the spirit of Jesus? How does one receive this new nature? How does one have one's sins forgiven? Well, it's most certainly not by uh, by works, but it's received by faith, church. Look down at verse 1 of chapter 3 of Galatians. The Apostle Paul says this, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that for whose eyes uh, you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun the Spirit, are you made now made perfect by the flesh? Such strong language by our Apostle Paul. He rebukes these Galatians for trying to be made perfect or being trying to be justified in the sight of God by the works of the law. He calls them foolish because it's a foolish thing to try to make oneself right in the sight of God by one's works. Indeed, a most vain and futile endeavour. Yet, though, this is what Lordship Soteriology would have us believe. This is because, dear friends, in God's economy, in God's way of reconciliation, which is the only way, a man is declared justified, a man is declared right in the sight of God and given the precious Holy Spirit through the hearing of faith. If you want to take notes, church, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, Apostle Paul says this, In whom ye trusted, after that ye heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. The congregation, the way of salvation is so very simple. We hear the word of the truth of the gospel, we then believe that, and then we are sealed with the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. 
Praise God. But you see, there's a stark difference in lordship theology. They put the cart before the horse. You can see it on the screen there. They put the cart before the horse. Instead of faith, they preach that you must do something for God. They put that impossible burden upon the lost. And I remember this uh, quite clearly when I was sharing the gospel message to my neighbour. His response was, I cannot come to God. I cannot come to God. I've got too much sin in my life. I can't turn from those sorts of sins. Well, I said, Amen. None of us can. None of us can. And so I preached to him the word of God. I said, if you would believe in Jesus Christ, you'll receive the spirit. And then God will deal with those things later on. You don't have to worry about those things. We must come to God by faith. And I praise God. He accepted Jesus Christ as his saviour. He believed upon him. And that's a blessed thing. Amen, church. So friends, this brings me to my next point this morning regarding lordship theology. Is that they fail to rightly divide the word of truth. They fail to rightly divide the word of truth. Of truth, you would church turn with me to Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two. Now we here at Isle Street Baptist Church, we are a dispensational church, meaning we take the commands of Second Timothy chapter two very seriously. If you're there, in, uh, there, look down at verse fifteen. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to the up and coming um, preacher uh, Timothy, and he says this. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the Holy Spirit is teaching us here, if we are to be serious students of, and disciples of the word, we must know the word of God, we must apply the word of God, but we also must know how to rightly divide the word of God. Otherwise, we'll be confused. We're mixed up in certain doctrines, especially in our soteriology, in our doctrine of salvation. Now, I don't have time here to go into a full dissertation on dispensational theology. But in summary, the great theologian Charles Rory, in his book of the same name, he defined it as this. The world is a household run by God. In this household world, God is administering its affairs according to his own will and in various stages of revelation in the passage of time. And uh, these various stages marks off the distinguishing different economies in the outworking of his total purpose. And these different economies constitute the dispensations. Now, there's five different distinctions which is held most dispensationals believe in their theology. Number one, a literal Historical and grammatical, uh, grammatical interpretation should be applied to all portions of the scripture. So we shouldn't just allegorize away prophecy, should we? We need to take it in its place as literal. Number two, the church in Israel are two distinct peoples in God's program for the ages. So the church has not replaced Israel, uh, and the, Israel is not the church. Number, number three, the Lord Jesus Christ will return bodily to the earth to reign on David's throne in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And we are very much looking forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. We see this world today, it's filled with sin, it's filled with wickedness. But when Jesus Christ rules from Jerusalem, he shall, be, he shall reign in perfect peace. Amen. 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 Number four, the underlying purpose of God's dealing of man is not merely the salvation of man, but rather his glory. And so the scriptures go beyond just uh, evangelism. It's for the glory of glory of God. And number five, this is very, very, very important to understand. The Christian is free completely from the law for not only justification, but also for sanctification, how we grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said, you're not under the law, but under grace. We are under grace today. And you'll see on the screen there, <clears throat> Uh, these different dispensations, which uh, classical dispensationalists hold to. We have the age of innocence, the age of conscience, the age of government, the age of promise, the age of law. And with the insertion of the church, we now have the church age, which we are blessed to be living in today. At the end of the church age, we, of course, will be raptured. We'll go up to meet the Lord in the end, forever be with the Lord. What a blessed hope we have as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, who's looking forward to the rapture. Yep, the cry of our heart is Maranatha. Amen. Amen. And then, of course, God will, uh, he's not finished with the nation of Israel. The kingdom has been postponed. They rejected their king, didn't they? When the Lord Jesus Christ come, came to earth. 
And, but God is faithful to his promises. And so he will deal with them during the tribulation period. Um, and then, of course, Jesus Christ will come back. Uh, Pastor Noel is going to touch on that uh, tonight. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back uh, and uh, set up his uh, kingdom. So we have the thousand years reign of Christ. And then we go into eternity. And so that is dispensational theology. Now, most of all, but not all of Lordship Salvation proponents fail to recognize this teaching, these distinctives in their interpretations of Scripture. And so they mixed uh, certain verses together and therefore come away with a works-based message. And therefore, it is most imperative on us as students of the Word, as saints in Jesus Christ, to apply these distinctives to our Bible study. Let the Bible interpret the Bible for what it says in its plain and literal reading. So if you're not in a Bible study, I very much encourage you to be a part of a Bible study. We heard about it earlier. We have uh, Jim, we have Kate, we have Brother Paul. Um, we have the ladies' Bible study as well. So I very much encourage you to get into a Bible study to understand the Word of God uh, and to obey the Word of God. It's going to be a blessing in your life. Amen. An example of this in Matthew 24 is our Lord's famous Olivet Discourse. While he's speaking to the Jews, he's speaking to those Israelitish disciples, those who would go through this seven-year tribulation period. The Daniel's prophesied 70th week, also known as the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation. He says in verse 13, he says, Those who endure to the end, the same shall be saved. So what is the Lord speaking about here? Well, in context, most Lordship Salvation proponents would insert the church into this passage. But it's clearly not talking about the church. It's talking about or salvation from sins. But rather, he's talking to Israel, uh, speaking of a physical deliverance from the reign of the Antichrist. So we need to rightly divide the word of God. It's so important in our Bible study. Um, and so we need to not take verses which are under the law when the kingdom was being offered to Israel and apply them to the church age. Amen. We need to rightly divide the word of truth. That is because, because church... All of God's word is for us, no doubt. All of God's word is for us. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, uh, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So all the Bible is for us, but not all the Bible, not all of God's word is necessarily about us. Amen. So we must make that distinction. And we have these divisions which I've put there in our Bibles, just a few there. And of course, the obvious one, we have the Old and New Testament. We have law, then we have grace. We have Israel, and then we have the church. We even have the flesh and the spirit, these two natures in the believer. But I want to touch on now the difference between salvation and discipleship, between justification uh, and sanctification. And we have on the slide here uh, these differences, these distinctives between these two things. Justification, how we're made right in the sight of God. And discipleship, or sanctification, how we grow in holiness. Progressive sanctification, some people call it. So we have here, one is a free gift. The other is costly. It does cost you to serve the Lord, amen. You have to read your Bible, you have to uh, go to church, all these sorts of things. But it's, it's, a, it's a blessing to serve the Lord, amen. Amen. One is received through faith, the other is entered into through commitment or obedience through the Spirit's enablement. And I want to really emphasize that point. You can't do anything without the Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ said in John 15, uh, without me you can do some things. No, he says without me you can do nothing. So we must be connected to the vine, the Lord Jesus Christ. One is by works, the other involves our cooperation with the Spirit's help. One is instantaneous, we saw that in Ephesians chapter 1. At the moment we believe, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. The other one is a lifelong process. We need to grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Uh, one is where Jesus paid the price. He paid the price, amen, at Calvary. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. But in discipleship, the believer pays the price. Um, and then, of course, we have one is experienced by all Christians. All those who believe are Christians. But... Sanctification of discipleship, sadly, is not experienced by all believers. Uh, one results in eternal life, being made righteous and going to heaven. And one, discipleship, results in rewards. We'll receive rewards at the Bema seat for what we did with our life, serving the Lord Jesus um, through the Spirit's help. <clears throat> okay. 
So I want to really um, emphasize that who thinks it's an absolute privilege to serve the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Raise your hand. It's a privilege to serve Jesus Christ. I found that in my own life. And I want to emphasize this, that we serve and live for the King. We deny ourselves. We take up our cross. Uh, we, we, we turn from our sins. We submit to the Lordship of Christ, not in order to be saved, not in order to stay saved, because it's a blessing. It's a blessing to serve the risen Lord Jesus the Bible says the love of Christ constraineth us or compels us to serve Jesus Christ. And I know for myself, I know many of you here can say it's not a burden, it's not a religious chore to serve Jesus Christ, but it's a privilege. Amen. Amen. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10 uh, that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That, we, that God which had before ordained that we not must, but we should serve him and walk in those good works. So I want to encourage you saints all this morning to go on to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Forsake the world, forsake your sins, forsake these things, not in order to be saved, but in order to have the blessing of serving Jesus Christ. Amen. The second to last church, this doctrine of Lordship salvation, I want to examine the most common word which is used in the scriptures. But it's often misunderstood and misappropriated by many within Lordship theology. And that is the word repent. So if you would turn with me, church, to John chapter 16, the book of John chapter 16. Now in Lordship Theology, many would remark that without repentance from sin, without repenting from, from your sins or turning from your sins, no one can be saved. Now we have here a quote uh, from Paul Washer. He's a very famous uh, Calvinistic preacher. And uh, he explains lordship position on repentance. What do they believe repentance is? And he says this in his, uh, in his book, Narrow Gate, Narrow Way. I quote, What you need to know is that salvation is by faith alone in Jesus Christ. Now, once again, if you just stop there, we would say, Amen, praise the Lord. That's a good message. But he continues, And faith alone in Jesus Christ is inseparable from repentance. <coughs> repentance is a turning away from sin, a hatred for the things that God hates, and a love for the thing that God loves and a growing in holiness. Furthermore, he says this, a person isn't saved by repent, repeating a prayer, amen, they're not, by believing in Jesus Christ, but he says they are saved by repenting of their sins and believing in Jesus Christ. Now, now may I have first remark, dear friends, and you may be surprised to even know this, that not once from Genesis to Revelation is the phrase, repent of your sins used in the sacred scriptures. Not once. From the beginning of the Garden of Eden to the glories of the New Jerusalem, not once is this phrase used in God's canon. Now the word repent itself is used many times in various ways throughout the biblical narrative, over a hundred times throughout scripture. But did you know more often than not it's used of God? That the Almighty, the Most High King, is seen repenting more than men. Therefore, cannot mean that God turned from sin. Obviously, there is no unrighteousness with the Blessed Trinity. Jehovah is indeed without sin. He is separate from sinners. The scriptures teach us that the seraphims in the presence of God cry out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There can be no sin with God. So what does the word mean? Well, in the New Testament, the word repent is used which is in the Greek metanoia, which means to change one's mind. Now, an example of this in Paul's preaching, when in Athens, he was proclaiming the gospel of the grace of God to those Grecians, and he preached this, he said, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. See, as this great man of God looked around, he saw all the idols in Athens, and his spirit was stirred within him. And he came to Mars Hill and he preached that famous sermon and demonstrated that God's program has changed. Now he commands all men everywhere to repent. So repent of those idols. Change your mind about the, the, those idols which cannot save you. Those things which are made with men's hands, which have no saving power in them. And believe in the true creator, the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone is the saviour of all men. And this was Paul's glorious, salvific message, the same message we herald today. Amen. For indeed, we must repent of our sin, though. 
the sin of unbelief. You would turn with me to in, in John chapter 16. I want you to look down at verse 8. The Holy Spirit and his work in this present age of grace. This is what uh, 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 Jesus Christ is speaking about. He says, when he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He goes on to say why he proves the, reproves the world of sin. Of sin because they what? Believe not on me. There is but one sin which I'll send you straight to the pits of hell. It's the sin of unbelief, of rejection of that glorious grace gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit today is convicting and convincing sinful men of their rejection of Jesus Christ, the neglect of Jesus Christ, and their consequent unbelief in Jesus Christ. See, friends, your reformation of your life will not save you. Many people can go down to an AA, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous program and, and change their life around. That will not do in God's economy. Turning from your sins will not save you. You even modifying your behaviour will not save you. Your charitable deeds will not save you. You even being sorrowful over your sins will not save you. We have the example of Judas. He was very sorrowful, wasn't he? Yet he was not saved. But rather it's faith in the provision of the Son of God. Amen, church must keep that simple keep that simple gospel message this friend is the true repentance unto salvation as we saw earlier these distinctions between salvation and discipleship and we should with the with the help of the blessed holy spirit turn from our sins in our lives we must forsake our evil way but this is a matter of discipleship and not a matter or prerequisite for salvation Furthermore, I note in that great salvific book of the Gospel of John, not once is the word repent used. But another word is used, which is prominent in his writings. It's used over 70 times. Do you know what that word is, church? Believe, believe, believe. And the, the Apostle John gives reason for his writing of this Gospel. The Holy Spirit tells us in chapter 20 and verse 30 of the end of his Gospel, he says this, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might repent of your sins. No. These are written that you might make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. No. These are written that you might make a pledge or promise to obey God. No. These are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. Friends, the purpose of the book of John is evangelistic. It's for the salvation of souls. So it seems quite peculiar to me that not once is the word repent used. That's because when the condemned sinner believes in Jesus Christ, when he believes who he is and what he did for us on the cross of Calvary, he has changed his mind. He's gone from death unto life. He's given the Holy Spirit And thus he has repented. For this is God's will, church, that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance through faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who proclaimed, He who believes in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. But church, the last aspect I'll leave you with today, this Lord's Day, I know we've gone through quite a bit this morning is the matter of the assurance of salvation. Can we be assured of our salvation? If you would, church, last place I'll have you turn in God's precious words to Titus chapter 1, the book of Titus chapter 1. I'm really fired up about this, this, this message. And it's because um, I see Lordship Theology as a real uh, burden upon the church. And we must be grace-oriented in our, um, the way we serve the Lord, the way we serve other people, not of legalism, not of uh, because we have to, but because we get to. And I really want to emphasize that here this morning. So last place, Titus chapter 1. Now, Lordship theology is soaked in much of Calvinistic teaching, and therefore it goes forth and teaches this doctrine of tulip, which we recall last time we, we touched on. The P in tulip is known as the perseverance of the saints. We're just taught that those who are truly saved will persevere in good works and faith unto the end of their life. I have a quote there on the screen there from John Piper, a very famous proponent of Calvinism and Lordship Salvation. 
And he says this, no Christian can be sure that he is a true believer. Hence, there is an ongoing need to be dedicated to the Lord and to deny ourselves so that we might make it. You see, sadly, this, this, he's, he's believing in himself, obeying God that will get him to heaven. It's a very sad thing. So we see that those who teach such a doctrine, they can never really be assured of their salvation, can they? They're constantly examining their works. They're constantly looking at themselves to see if they are saved. As we've seen this morning in this theology that one must deny himself, one must turn from his sins, one must uh, be subject to the Lord Jesus Christ in all areas of your life. I don't know about you, but there's some areas in my life which I've not yet submitted for the Lordship of Christ. Um, so that's a daily battle, isn't it? Amen, church? But we see here that no wonder those who teach and preach such a doctrine lack the assurance of salvation. Instead of basing one's salvation on the infallible, inerrant, and sure word of God, they're placing upon themselves their obedience to Christ and their works, and therefore it is most subjective. This theology breeds doubt. It breeds confusion. It destroys and cripples assurance, as we've seen here from John Piper. It brings forth a spirit of bondage and fear. For I ask, how many works are needed? What type of works must they be? How consistent do they have to be? How much obedience is called for? How many sins do I really need to turn from? And how fast must they come after I believe in Jesus Christ? See, friends, how this, is, this breeds confusion, it breeds doubt. This theology puts an emphasis on self instead of saviour. It places an emphasis on the, import, on the performance of me instead of the performance of Jesus. It places an emphasis on our work instead of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Now, though this is a sad reality, those who teach and preach such a doctrine negate the unfortunate reality and truth that there is such a thing as a carnal Christian. The Apostle Paul deals with this in his epistle to the church at Corinth. Now, Paul was, of course, writing to say believers. He calls them brethren. He calls them saints in Jesus Christ. They were sanctified positionally uh, before the Lord Jesus. And so, but they, had, they were involved in serious sin. You read the book of 1 Corinthians, they were involved in serious sin in their life. They were in carnality. They were, there was divisions. There was puffing up of pride. They were tolerating sexual immorality such that should not be even named among the Gentiles. And uh, they were suing one another in court. They were uh, defiling the Lord's Supper and they were corrupting the gifts of the Spirit. So this is very much a carnal church. And you see on the slide there are three types of Christians which are mentioned in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 3. We have first the infant uh, believer, though, who's first come to Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul calls them babes in Christ. They've just recently come to the Lord, and so they might have a fair bit of baggage in their life. Secondarily, there is carnal believers, um, those who are walking in the flesh and not walking after the Spirit. Um, this, is a, this is a reality, uh, of course. There are the spiritual believers, those who have put the word of God into their life. They're walking in the spirit and walking after God's grace. And so that's what we must be, amen, church? Spiritual believers. And so the admonition for us is don't be like Corinth, but be like Christ. Pursue him. Develop your relationship with him. Be grown up into that spiritual man he's, or woman he's called you to be. But if you fall, and friends, you will fall in your Christian life, to regain that blessed fellowship, often we, we say John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all um, righteousness. I recently um, put this on my, on my wall, this quote from 1 John. The blood of his son, Jesus Christ, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. What a blessed reality. We are cleansed from all sin. Sins in the past, sins I do now, sins in the future, it's all paid by Jesus Christ. And so what a blessed thing that is. But friends, he wants fellowship with you. He desires that intimacy, doesn't he? He wants such a life. You living that Christ life. Christ living his life through you, having that fellowship with the Lord Jesus. And that is the, ble the best life you'll live here this side of eternity. So how do we have biblical assurance, church? we look to our works? <clears throat> Must we live in constant fear as to whether or not our sins have been forgiven? How can we be assured of our salvation? If you look down to our text, church, we had you in Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, look down at verse 2. <clears throat> the Bible says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie 
promised before the world began. This is blessed words from the Holy Spirit in Scripture. God cannot lie. God promised. And may I say, God's promises never fail. Amen. Dear believer, God wants you to be assured of your eternity. You need not be in fear, but rather in faith in what Jesus Christ has done for you. The Apostle Paul, he knew this assurance towards the end of his life, after the beatings and persecutions, after the many trials and temptations from Satan and from false apostles, just before he was uh, to depart this world unto the next, he stated this in triumphant surety in 2 Timothy. He says, For the which cause I suffer these things, nevertheless I'm not ashamed, for I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Friends, he was assured of his salvation because he knew it wasn't contingent upon himself. He knew that God cannot lie. He knew that the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob is a covenant-keeping God, a promise-keeping God. And so we too, church, can be persuaded of our eternal salvation because of the infallible, the inerrant, the unshakable word of God which says, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Amen. But the Apostle Peter, he also knew the assurance of salvation by the power of the word of God. And he stated in his epistle that we have a more sure word of prophecy, even more sure than being a testimony of the, the glorified Saviour on the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw that, but he says that I have a more sure word of prophecy in the word of God, even more sure than seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. He says this, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Friends, the gospel message by the preaching of the infallible, inerrant word of God is sure. And it promises the reality that he who believes in Jesus Christ shall never die. I will never come into condemnation because I've believed upon Jesus Christ. If you've believed upon Jesus Christ, you'll never have to worry about going to hell. Amen. But oh, how we must look only to Christ and not to ourselves. There is, of course, a necessity in the Christian life for a self-examination. I do not negate that reality. When we come to the Lord's table, we're to examine ourselves and so on and so forth. But when it comes to assurance, when it comes to our salvation, we don't look to our feelings. We don't look to our emotions. We don't look to our sins because we're filled with misery, with sin and with woe. But Christ is filled with grace and with glory and with the uncompromising truth of life everlasting. We need not wait till eternity to have assurance of our salvation. We can have assurance today by looking unto Christ and his word. The great reformer Martin Luther, he came out of the bondage of Catholicism, of work salvation. And he said this, when I look at myself, I don't see how I can be saved. Oh, but when I look at Christ, I don't see how I can be lost this is what Hebrews speaks of, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and has now sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You see, if I looked at my life, my performance, one day I think I'd be doing pretty well, the next day, not so well. It'd be constant doubt. Constant fear as to whether or not I've believed in Jesus Christ. But if I look totally at Christ, what he did at the cross, his steadfast and immovable promises that I can know without a shadow of a doubt, I am going to heaven. Do you have that assurance today, church? Do you have that assurance today? If you're troubled, maybe you're doubting, don't look to the left. Don't look to the, to the right. Don't look at self. Look at Jesus Christ. Look at the glorified Christ in heaven by faith. Unto his unchangeable word, where the Lord Most High proclaims, Look unto me, all the ends of the earth, and be ye saved. Be established in the doctrine of eternal security. Therefore, the darts of Satan, the doubts from self, shall most assuredly flee. 
So, beloved, which John will you believe? John Piper or John the Apostle of the risen Lord Jesus Christ, who says that he who believes in me has everlasting life. So in conclusion, dear saints, I know I've taken much of your time this morning, but it's a blessing to be in church. I want to conclude by these quotes here. I want you to keep the gospel simple. Keep the gospel pure. Keep the gospel free. Keep the gospel simple for its power is manifest in its simplicity, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Keep the gospel pure from works corruption and from Galatian error. And keep the gospel free. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And he offers salvation as a gift. So friend, maybe you've been caught up in Lordship Theology. Maybe you've been doubting. Maybe you haven't come to the end of yourself and trusted only in Jesus Christ and his shed blood at the cross of Calvary. I pray today that you'll take up the water of everlasting life freely from the throne of God. I pray that today that you will believe solely in the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone is why I'm going to heaven. He alone is why I'm saved. And he alone is why I have eternal life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your free gift of salvation. I thank you, Lord, for putting this message upon my heart to preach to your saints this morning, to build them up in their faith, to encourage them, to bless them. But Lord, if there be any who are trusting in themselves, if they're trusting in their own works, if they're trusting in anything other than Jesus Christ, him crucified, oh, I pray, Lord God, that you would spur them on to faith in Jesus Christ and him alone. Uh, Lord, we thank you that your salvation is free, that it's simple and available to all. You don't, you don't, you don't not will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance through faith in you. And so I pray today, we as your servants, Lord, would herald this message far and wide through the distribution of tracts, through the way we live. And may you help us to open our mouth boldly to preach the gospel to our neighbours, to our friends, to our loved ones, and to the lost. Oh Lord, how we need you for our salvation. We thank you, Lord, for your salvation though. We love you and we proclaim your praises both now and forevermore. And it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.